Recipes for technical trading success in Cook's Kitchen. Hey everybody, Cooker here. It's time to talk about the virtual economy. Um, good story this morning from uh, Renaissance Macro Research, uh, senior uh, macro strategist there, Neil Duda, who I'm sure you've seen uh, on the networks. Uh, he published a piece about you know, addressing this question, hey, the ri rising stocks are ignoring the terrible economy crowd is missing something, you know, that everybody wants to know what, you know, hey, the stock market's on fire, it, it's ignoring the terrible economy, you know, this can't work, it can't persist, it doesn't make sense. We're going to talk about some of that, and we'll, we'll look at uh, a great chart from Neil Duda. Um, I want to show you a piece I wrote on Monday over the weekend, actually, um, for Zach's Confidential, the virtual economy, digital remote intelligent, where I'm trying to zero in on why, you know, the, the software stocks and e-commerce, um, you know, Amazon obviously are all on fire and, and why they can continue to do so. And I, I shared uh, a really good piece from Christopher Mims of the Wall Street Journal that he published on Saturday, the 22nd. Uh, let me scroll down to that. His piece was titled, COVID-19 is dividing the American worker. And just to give you the, the teaser here, the rapid adoption of remote work and automation could accelerate inequalities already in place for decades. Economists say the resulting K-shaped economy will be good for professionals and bad for everyone else. Uh, the first time I'd ever heard that, uh, he cites a, an economist named Piketty. Um, the K being uh, professionals who can work remotely, are data-oriented, remote-oriented, digital. Um, you know, they're already on the, the upward-sloping part of the K. And a lot of other workers are on the downward sloping part of the K. So that, that's the idea there. So Mims called this the most important thing I've ever published. I'll, this is exactly what he said on Twitter. This is the most important thing I've ever published. And I've been a technology journalist for more than a decade. That's a, that's a pretty powerful statement. Um, and I'll show you why he thinks that when we look at some of the uh, so some of the quotes, some of the data he put on Twitter about the article. And obviously, you can find the, the article on the Wall Street Journal by this title right here, COVID-19 is Dividing the American Worker. Uh, first, I want to show you what are some of the, something that I've written, a couple of things I've written that I've thought for a long time were the most important things I ever had ever written. Back in June of 2016, I wrote a piece for Zach's Confidential titled Big Economic Disruption, Big Data, AI, and Robotics, because I saw that these were the things that were causing economic disruption. Um, and I wanted to address, like, are there specific, you know, robotics companies we can go out there and buy, AI companies? Um, I didn't know enough about NVIDIA then to say you should definitely buy NVIDIA. I wish I had. You could have still bought it under 100 bucks then. Uh, but... Uh, but I was, but as I explored big data and robotics, I said, listen, let's make this simple. Right now, you should just buy Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, and IBM. And of those three, or of those four picks, obviously three did very well. This, this is June of 2016. You could have bought Amazon and Google under 750 bucks, and you could have bought Microsoft near 50. Uh, IBM's basically treaded water for uh, four years. But because, because I wanted to make it simple, because really it wasn't so much about robotics, it was about automation. What big data and AI were allowing big scalable companies to do was automate everything. And so that's why Amazon, Microsoft, and Google have done as well as they have. All right, then fast forward uh, I was to December of 2017. I did another Zax Confidential. And by the way, Zax Confidential, I'm just going to give it a little plug here because it's it's an incredible bargain. I can't believe we we offer this thing so cheap. It's only sixty dollars a year, and you get a fresh report from one of our editors or strategists every Monday. 
and there's you know there's ten of us, and so we have we're on a rotating schedule. We have a couple of months to prepare our big idea for the quarter, um, and you know Tracy Reinick, Brian Bolin, uh, Dave Bartosiak. I mean, we come up with some really good stuff. So in in December of 2017, I wrote the second most important piece I think I've ever written, and I called it the Technology Supercycle, because 18 months later, after that June piece, I still had this burning question. Why was there so much productivity and so little inflation, and yet you didn't really see it? You don't see it in GDP, and you don't see it in the government productivity numbers. So my thesis was that technology was actually accelerating growth in ways that we couldn't see because productivity was hidden in the government data and, and obviously inflation was uh, you know AWOL. So I put together I got some answers and I said, hey, where's the what's the first missing link here in productivity? Got some help from Brian Westbury at First Trust, who said, hey, the government productivity numbers are buried with government spending um, in, in the denominator. So that's why productivity growth seems so small when in actuality, in all kinds of high-tech industries, uh, software, semiconductors, you're, you have you know, three, five, 10% growth per year in productivity, but you don't see it in the, the government's official productivity number. So that's where productivity is hidden. And then the missing link too, you know, where's the inflation? Well, uh, you know, that's, a, that's as simple as Moore's Law. Uh, uh, Joe Davis from Vanguard wrote a piece right before I wrote mine in November of 2017, the Federal Reserve versus Moore's Law. You know, the Fed's pushing on a string, trying to create inflation, couldn't do it. And why? Because technology innovation is what keeps inflation so low. You, when you, when you, the computer chips still get smaller and more powerful every couple of years, um, that creates all kinds of of efficiency and automation tools. Okay, so let's take a look at Christopher Mims and his report. Um, here it was, here's the here's the K-shaped economy, professionals taking the up escalator, workers without digital skills, remote, you know, the ability to work remotely, um, taking the down escalator. So to him, it's, a, it's an inequality thing that has nothing to do with policy, it's just what's happening um, as as the digital transformation got accelerated by five to ten years, this is uh, you know this is what I've been talking about in lots of my articles here. Uh, let's just review, uh, you know, Cook's Kitchen pieces here for the for the past few weeks. Software goes stratosphere on planet COVID. Um, inflation coming, you know, the charts you need to see to believe, and bull market on steroids. Those those recent Cook's Kitchens address this idea of how the digital transformation got accelerated five to 10 years because companies had to adapt uh, or perish. Okay, so back to MIMS. So I wanna just highlight in his thread the, the stuff he was talking about. And this is all just from his, uh, from his Twitter feed. People with a high school degree or less in the US, which is about half of all Americans, have seen their real wages decline for the past 30 years. And the median wage of all workers has stagnated, but why? Here are some answers. Many economists, uh, and he mentions this, uh, Piketty among them, pin the blame for economic inequality on politics and the way power protects itself. Mim says, hey, they're not wrong, but this emphasis obscures the underlying forces of technological change that disrupt the lives of workers. Uh, he says, you may think you've heard this story before, a tale as old as automation, but things are different now. Automation is more capable because machines have been wedded to computers. So it's both replacing humans in, uh, and making humans more interchangeable. He says, you see it in the data. Um, and he's got a chart coming up here. He says, this is the most important chart you've never seen before. If it's correct, it should be in textbooks. Heck, it should be on t-shirts. It shows how, especially in the US, we tax human labor, but subsidize automation. And so this is from his Twitter feed. Um, so here it is from you know early 80s to uh, the late teens here. Um, labor has been consistently taxed around a 25% uh, level. 
and what, what's been the trend for software and equipment. Um, economists argue we are now subsidizing the replacement of, of humans with robots, or not robots you can necessarily see, but automation, even when the robots aren't as productive. So that, you know, that's the, the powerful data that he's looking at. Okay, and he says, what's more? Research indicates that because automation is more capable than ever, the old equation of when companies have more money, they hire more workers is inverted. He says now they just spend it on more automation. Um, so, you know, MIMS, you know, I don't want, I'm not getting political here, and I don't even know if MIMS has a bias, but he's looking at data here. I think the, the, the article and the data are worth taking a look at. All right, now let's go to Neil Duda at Renaissance Macro. He'd actually, so he publishes this piece on uh, Business Insider this morning. I'll just show that real quick. So here's his piece uh, this morning on Business Insider. The rising stocks are ignoring the terrible economy crowd is missing the clear reasons for the market surge. And so he addresses, you know, the, the, the standard trope is that, well, the stock market isn't the economy. Yeah, true. But he says it's also not not the economy. And uh, so he says analysts that continue to lament the market's rise would be better served trying to understand why they've been wrong instead of regurgitating mindless platitudes about the market's alleged irrationality. Uh, <laughs> pretty poignant uh, tweet there from from Duda. All right. So I want to go right to a chart he included in the Business Insider piece. He actually. Uh, created this data chart uh, a couple of days ago, but I, I just became familiar with it this morning. Let's see, it's coming up here. Okay, here it is. So he says, the, this is from August 19th, the stock market has been rewarding companies doing well and punishing companies doing poorly. Says, this figure plots the percent change since February of S&P 1500 subsectors against the comparable retail sales category. The results send a clear message. The market is not not the economy either. All right, so you got to think about that one. So here he says, "Sorry, the market is not dumb." So what do you you know what what's doing really well? Obviously, non-store retail sales, uh, home improvement, um, department stores, apparel and accessories. You know, down here, not doing so well. So you know, this is how he's, he's trying to explain the market is isn't dumb because uh, money is is flowing, you know, let's put it this way. If, if G, GDP reflects small businesses, 60% of, of employed Americans work for a small business. Those small businesses sh show up in GDP, um, but they don't show up in the stock market. What does show up in the stock market from those consumers and small businesses? They're spending. So the real question is, has spending been dented that much, even with the uh, pandemic forced recession. Um, and the data would say no, that uh, it's just that spending is getting channeled in different ways. Obviously, um, with with Amazon, um, and then companies investing in software. All right, so that's is the the my basic theme for today on the uh, the virtual economy. And Again, you can find my Zach's Confidential piece here, published this week, The Virtual Economy, Digital Remote Intelligent. You have, and, and those two older pieces I showed you from June of 2016 and December of 2017, they're in the archives. 60 bucks a year. Uh, just email um, ultimate at zax.com and they can hook you up. And believe me, I, you, you will not be disappointed with, with this offering. I, I think it's, it's too cheap that we sell it for 60 bucks a year. Um, but the, the other message I wanna leave you with is, is Twitter. What did I do? I didn't, uh, you know, I used, I used reporters and strategists bringing data and analysis to Twitter. And again, just another example of, yeah, there's a lot, there's too much politics on Twitter and it can become uh, its own uh, negative uh, doom scrolling event there every day if you want it. But, there is also a lot of smart people bringing good analysis and data, um, whether it's uh, um, you know 
an investment advisory firm, research firm like Renaissance Macro and Neil Duda, or a really good reporter and researcher, Christopher Mims at the Wall Street Journal. So this is this is why you know Twitter should be a, a part of your your process of finding out what what is the latest, greatest content and analysis. All right. Thanks for joining me in the kitchen and we'll talk to you next week.